What can you do? 
of the other name. What can you change? One more time. Creator of, creator of the universe. What can you do? What can you do? What can you change? Cause you are able, you are able, great and mighty God. You are able, great and mighty God. You are able. for Jesus Hallelujah One more time Creator Creator of the universe What can you do? Name above every other name What can you do? What can you change? One more time, Creator of the universe. What can you do? What can you change? Name above every other name. What can you do? What can you change? Oh, 
exalt you and we honor you. We thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us as individuals and as an institution. We thank you for your kindness and love, for your mercy and grace. We thank you for the opportunity you give us from time to time to gather together in your name, to fellowship with one another in your name, and also to be ministered to by you. We thank you for ARU, King of Glory. We thank you for what you're doing in this institution, King of Glory, and what you're continuing to do in the lives of our students, staff, and even members of faculty. We are so grateful for how you've continued to meet us at our points of needs and intervene in our situation. At this point, King of Glory, we remember our students, King of Glory, who are bereaved. We pray, King of Glory, for Ezron and for Michelle, King of Glory, who have lost their siblings. We trust that in a special way you will encourage and strengthen them. You will affirm and uphold them and grant them comfort and healing even at such a time as this. We pray that the Lord will reveal himself to them as a healer, as a comforter, and as their very present help even in their times of need. We continue to pray, King of Glory, and lift our needs, Jeridima, the things that weigh us down, burdens in our hearts. We lift them to you, King of Glory, because you care for us. And we trust that you will meet each one of us at our points of needs and intervene even in the things that this world brings our way. We continue to pray with Lillian, King of Glory, who is unwell, and even pray with Florence, who has lost the niece, that you continue to minister to them, continue to comfort them, encourage them, and strengthen them. We pray for your healing hand to be stretched upon Lillian, that she will experience your healing power, King of Glory. We pray for needs, dear Redeemer, represented in chapel today, that should there be people in our midst who are discouraged, who are going through difficult issues, King of Glory, we pray that your healing and your comfort, dear Redeemer, will abound to them, dear Redeemer, through this chapel session, and even abide with them as they live. We worship you and we look up to you, King of Glory, for your intervention, for your mercy, for your grace, and for your strength to see us through. In Jesus' name we pray, believing and trusting. Amen. Let's appreciate the worship team. You can also invite your neighbor, tell them Karibu Chapel, and then you have your seat. Praise the Lord. Buana Sifiwe. Please wave at me. Buana Sifiwe. Amen. That's the Swahili word for praise the Lord. Amen. It's great to have each one of you in chapel this morning. I have a few notices to put across before I bring on our speaker. One is that the Acts Bookshop have offers. They have 50% offer on a collection of books at, the, at retail price. And so we encourage you to pass by Acts Bookshop either after this or in the course of this week. It's the, the offer will run through the month of November. So there are fantastic deals like Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem and Robin Culver will retain at, they'll retail that at 2,250 down from 4,500. And then for these and more titles, you can make your order through their office line. Uh, we will share this, uh, but you can also pass by Axe Bookshop. Do you know where Axe Bookshop is? Yes, Axe Bookshop is next to the uh, security and safety office. So you can just pass by there and grab for yourself a book or be part of the offer that they are giving. Then I want to publish the bonds of marriage between Stephen Njoroge, son of Elizabeth Njoroge, of Pentecostal Church Kinangop, and Ruth Omolo, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Maurice Omolo of Sitam Rongai. If any of you know any cause or just impediment why these people should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you, dec you declare it. Ye are to declare it. This marriage will take place at ARU Grounds Kijiji on Friday, 3rd of December, 2021. This is the second time of asking. I published the bonds of marriage between Dennis Hindobey Make, son of Raymond Make, of Badsell United Brethren in Christ Church, and Mary Ajiambo Billy, daughter of George and Lydia Billy, of Blessed Sacrament Buruburu. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. 
This marriage will take place at AIU Chapel on 27th November 2021. This is the second time of asking. And finally, we have a wedding invitation from one of our own, and this is the wedding between Shalin and Manu. Shalin and Emmanuel are members of this community. Shalin is a staff here at AIU. I don't know if Shalin is in chapel today. Yes, Shalin, you can stand and wave so that you, you can see you. Appreciate Shalin. <laughs> Shalin will be getting married to Emmanuel this coming December on 4th. Their wedding will be at All Saints Cathedral and thereafter reception at Loreto Convent Valley Road. And they've invited all of us and so it's not invites only, so we can all make our way to All Saints Cathedral and thereafter Loreto Convent uh, Valley Road for the reception. So they've all invited us and we continue to pray with them. I'm sure Chaplain will pray with them at the end of our service. Amen. Our speaker this morning is our own, a member of staff, Evelyn Wangari. Evelyn Wangari serves in the Chaplaincy and Community Life Department as a chaplaincy intern. She serves with the Fellowship of Christian Unions uh, under the short-term experience in ministry. She's been here for over a year, and she's been a blessing to our community, serving mainly with the Christian Union. And so I want us to put our hands together and invite Evelyn as she comes to share God's word with us. Praise God. I appreciate Timothy even as he takes his seat. Yeah, it's a joy this morning to, to be God's vessel and to listen from him together with all of us. And I trust that uh, at the end of it, the Lord is going to call us to obedience to his word. Amen. Yes, we have been um, journeying through the theme, Witnesses to the World. And with the aim of having us really become the witnesses that God wants us to be. The people who are going to pass on the good news to the unsaved and the people who have not believed Christ. And this part of the semester, we have been looking at a very critical aspect of the theme. And that is prepared for witnessing. Just uh, what really will help us to be prepared to be witnesses to the world, even before we think about going. What are some of the key things that we need to do or we need to go through so that we are ready witnesses uh, in this uh, great commission and the task that our God has really laid in each and every one of us? And many speakers have helped us to appreciate the fact that Witnessing is not just a select people thing. It's for every believer to reach out to an unbeliever. Everyone reaching another person with the gospel of Christ Jesus. And so this theme is for all of us as a community, as students, as staff, as the Lord wants to uh, help us through in this. So today we are focusing on the aspect that is uh, fellowship. So our topic is prepared for witness through fellowship. Prepared for witness through fellowship. This is a really great pillar in regards to our preparation as believers. I personally would attest that really fellowship has gone a long way into shaping my perspectives, into shaping who I am, and into shaping uh, my going out to reach out to people with the good news of Christ. So our scripture reflection today is Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 46. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 46, and I'll read. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and all things uh, were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The believers in this portion of scripture here depicted true fellowship by the fact that they did several things that I'll be mentioning to us. Firstly, the scripture mentions that they had things in common, actually all things in common. Again, they met each other's needs. They ate together in their homes. They attended the temple together. They devoted themselves in the teachings of the apostles. And elsewhere in scripture, in the same book of Acts chapter 4, the author explains the state of the believers again. And this for me wouldn't just be an obvious or normal repetition. It's just to bring to us the exact uh, state of the believers uh, then. One is that they were one in heart and mind, as you would read in chapter 4 of Acts. They were one in heart, one in mind. They were characterized by communal living. And that is uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but that they shared everything they had. There was no needy person amongst them. Why? Everyone came in and brought what they had and made sure that no one amongst us is lacking. So there was no needy person noted amongst them. Again, they, we have an example here of people who sold their lands and houses and possessions to cater for those in need, as I've mentioned. They not only came together for congregational fellowship, as is noted, but they also met in their houses. They would meet in the temple. They would meet uh, in their houses. They would have a habit or a habit of meeting together. And that, then they just did not just meet in their houses and in the temples. They prayed in those houses. There's something that they did. They just, they just did not just come together to meet. They met and prayed in their houses. They just did not pray in their houses. The scripture notes that they ate together. And they not only ate food together, they enjoyed each other's company, as is noted there. They praised God and attracted many to the kingdom. They were filled with awe. They came together and had a very perfect uh, feel of fellowship and enjoying each other's company because it's like everyone had something to bring on table. They ministered to each other's needs. And maybe something that we should be asking ourselves today, what is the importance of fellowship? Why should we really come together in fellowship? And as we talk about fellowship, we are not only talking about such a setting today. We are talking about settings like grace groups, small groups, moments where we meet ourselves in houses to just take tea together. Is it important to preparing us to go out and be witnesses for the Lord? Is fellowship important? And saying this, I would like to note that there are people who really... Uh, would want to just be away from fellowships. They feel, uh, I, mean, I don't want to be part of a fellowship somewhere. But to submit to us is that fellowship is, is important. And the first importance of fellowship is that specific burdens are laid in our hearts through fellowship. Specific burdens are laid in our hearts through fellowship. It will surprise you how much need you will uncover in people's lives as you continually meet with them. And some of these needs could be spiritual needs. These needs could be psychological. These needs could even be material needs. As we are looking at the church that met uh, as represented in the book of Acts, scripture mentions, mentions that there was no needy person in their midst, that they came in together, sold possessions, and ministered to the needs of those very people. And so when we continually meet with people, it will surprise you the way you're going to uncover the needs of people. It is in that small setting that you realize someone probably lost a close person, someone probably has lost a job, someone is struggling to raise their school fees, and that has come through the interaction that has come along with us sitting together and fellowshipping. But one challenge in 
our society today or in the church today is that believers have continued to fellowship with one another, but they have done so at the periphery. So we just come read the scriptures and go. We just come maybe sing and go. We come listen to a sermon and go, just at the periphery. Oftentimes we live in the assumption that everyone is okay, just as we are seated here today. Probably you might be feeling that you are okay, you do not have an issue that is disturbing you, and the temptation is very high to think that the person sitting on your right or your left is also okay. But that is not true. If you would really try to ask around, you would discover that someone somewhere is struggling with a particular issue that needs your maybe attention to prayer and to even encourage them. So the problem has been that, yes, we have tried to embrace fellowship, but then we have done it at the periphery. And the call for us today is to really discover the importance of meeting together and objectively meeting so that we are able to meet the needs of the uh, brethren that we are fellowshipping with. The other challenge in regards to that is the challenge in the body of Christ where we have plenty disunity and individualism, where life becomes, it's just about me, it's about what benefits me, it's about how much I have, it's about what I get in return, what's my benefit in all this, it's about me being, maybe just being okay. And as the Bible points out in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 9, I'll read, but understand this, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. I like the way scripture brings it out, times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of selves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with their sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So then, these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men as presented there. That people will begin to think about themselves. It's about me, it's about what I achieve, lovers of self, and actually, having an appearance of godliness, and yet that's false. Well, all this, as you would look at it, would be a challenge or something that really challenges fellowship. Where there is heartlessness, then fellowship will not thrive. Where there are ungrateful hearts, then fellowship is not going to thrive. As we read in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 46, the believers have been presented as people who shared and ate together with grateful and glad hearts. That they wanted to see each other thriving and, you know, growing and even being better and experiencing the Lord the more. But where there is brutality, where people are not loving good, where people have really denied the power of God and all that, then it gets to a point where our fellowship is going to be strained so that each and every one of us gets to fellowship just to get their needs satisfied and not really wanting to satisfy the needs of the other people in regards to really being involved directly in their lives. I'd like us to examine a case that has been recorded in Acts chapter 5 about a particular couple in the same record of acts of presenting the church as people who came together, sold their possession, and got to have a good communal interaction and fellowship. And we jump onto this example, which I would say it's an example not to follow for us. And that's the story of the man named Ananias and his wife, Safira. 
who sold a piece of property. With his, uh, with his wife's knowledge, so, uh, Ananias kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. This was a norm that if you sold a possession, then you would bring it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles would know how that would be distributed to cater for the needs of the people. Then Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, this, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At the moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Praise the Lord. A, a turn of events here. And, well, these people were just trying to, you know, kind of take part in what was happening in the, amongst the believers then by selling their possession and all that. But something happens differently with them. They decide to save a little for themselves. The scripture says that Ananias, even by his wife knowing this, decided to keep some Kidogo money for himself or Kidogo property, that uh, the money that he received from selling out his possession for himself. And he even stands out to speak and say that that's all. That's the much that we sold. But that wasn't true. This was discovered and was dealt with instantly by the Lord. The consequence is that the two fall dead in the presence of the people, in the presence of Peter, the apostle then. And as I have mentioned earlier, similarly today we have such cases that happen amongst us as believers. Not necessarily where uh, people are expected to go out and sell everything they have and then bring the money to church, but in the bit that we have sometimes developed selfish endeavors. Sometimes you are not concerned about whether your fellow brother or your fellow sister is okay. How is your longing for fellowship with, with believers? How is it with you taking part in what is happening in the body of Christ today? Are you doing it your own way as an individual? Is individualism crouching into you? Have you stood into a point where you do not want to be involved in what the church is doing, especially we who are in local churches and us who are in the community as this? Are you really interested in taking part in what is happening amongst uh, the believers? The example here is different from the believers who shared everything truthfully, who brought everything on table, who were gladly enjoying the company of each other, who were filled in with awe when they saw the signs and wonders happening. I found John Fawcett's story very intriguing. I'm going to read it out for us. In, in 1773, while a young pastor of a poor church in England, John Fawcett was called to a large and influential church in London. He was a powerful preacher and writer, and these skills brought him 
this opportunity. So he was kind of being called to go and pastor that influential church, to leave the poor church in England and move to London to pastor this uh, influential church. And as the wagons were being loaded with the faucet's few belongings, they were packing to leave, uh, their people came to a tearful farewell. Uh, just picture it, someone is packing. Sometimes we have had people packing to leave this community. Probably they, are, they have finished their studies or they are moving on to another place. And picture fellow believers coming on to really bid them farewell. And so this farewell was tearful, a tearful farewell in that case. And during the goodbyes, Mary Fawcett, who is the wife to John Fawcett, cried. And she said to John, I cannot bear to leave, nor can I, John replied. And they said, we shall remain here with our people. The wagons were unloaded, so they stopped parking to leave. So they unloaded the wagons. And John Fawcett spent his entire 54-year ministry in Winsgate. Out of that experience, Fawcett wrote the beautiful hymn, Blessed be the tie that binds. And the words of this hymn are that, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one. Our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual ooze. Our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other's flows the sympathizing tear. Reading through this hymn, I couldn't help but note the, the words that Fawcett uses. He uses the words like binds, which means bringing together. He uses Christian love. He uses oneness. He uses, he says, he uses mutual, and this means togetherness. And with this hymn, he was probably trying to bring out the feeling that came with them, uh, trying to live and going to London, but then the feeling that comes that we have been in a community, we have been in a church, and we have been experiencing good fellowship with people, and we feel that we do not want to live. We want to continue ministering to them. We want to continue being blessed with them together. And so he presents and says that together we presented our fears, our hope, our ooze unto the Lord. Our prayers were one. Our Christian love was one. There is something that bound us together. And my desire from that was that may the Lord help us to behold the beauty of fellowship wherever he leads us to. That as you stay in this community... Are you one who really desires that you would be one with the people in this community? Especially this would really apply to the believers. That in your house, in your block, wherever you're residing at, do you have the urge and the desire that would cause you to not consider individualism, but to reach out to people, to share out a cup of tea, to invite people over to your house for fellowship. Why? Because we are growing towards experiencing the Christian love, presenting our mutual prayers unto the Lord together with that mutuality or oneness. The second importance of fellowship is the enlightenment in the things of God that happens when we fellowship together. The first one I said is that we are able to really uncover the needs of people who are in our midst. Secondly is the enlightenment in the things of God that you know, comes with us fellowshipping together. As mentioned in scripture in Acts chapter 2, the believers they are devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. You can be sure that they learned a lot of things from these teachings. Sitting down to listen in from a sermon. Sitting down to listen from a, probably a conviction from a sister in a particular Bible study group or in the grace group. And the enlightenment that comes with it. Fellowship brings about growth. 
And it is here that we get to know God more and experience him more together and experience the love of Christ. It is in fellowship that our perspectives are molded, that our perspectives are challenged. Theological convictions are also challenged and enriched. I think I can attest to this one. When we have sat down majorly to just take tea and then theological conversations arise, and you begin to ask yourself, why do I believe in God? If I was to reach out to an unbeliever, what, what case would I build up? And sitting down to really and reach one another in such conversations is quite helpful. And it brings about a great impact even into how we reach out to other people in witnessing. I remember uh, some time back when one of the speakers was presenting to us uh, and uh, the examples of the gospel that is being preached out there and really trying to help us land on the true gospel. I think through that we were able to assess, is that the true gospel really? Is that the true gospel? Is that the true gospel? And we could finally really agree that this is the truth of the gospel that we would want to reach out to the people with. The same thing really ap applies when we meet in small groups and we share. You hear one person in the group uh, presenting a particular probably one of their theological convictions, and you want to address it because you feel that, hey, you would want to disagree with it a little bit. And that really helps in challenging and enriching uh, those perspectives and those convictions. So it's quite important that it's through fellowship that we are able to really grow and be able to stand out there and speak to non-believers and be able to present the truth of the gospel. Through listening into sermons, when we show up every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning for a chapel service, when we have speakers standing in and helping us to uncover the truth in the word of God, and as we pray that the Lord is going to open our eyes to see the truth in his word, that is quite important into who you are and into, who, uh, into the, the, the truths that you acquire that will help you to reach out to other people out there who do not know the truths of the word of God. And through this fellowship, you're able to assess yourself. You're able to even ask yourself important questions. By the way, why, what's my perspective about life? What's my perspective about salvation? Why did I even get born again in, in the first place? What does salvation mean to me? Proverbs 27 verse 17, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. And we cannot ever discredit that bit, that we can always come together and sharpen each other into the truths of the word of God so that we are ready witnesses, even as we prepare to go out to reach out to the unsaved. How then does fellowship prepare us for witness? We have seen the importance. How then does it prepare us for witness? The united body of Christ attracts non-believers. That's one of the ways I would say that it prepares us for witness, that those who are outside will watch us, will look at us and see a united body, a body that is growing together in love, a body that is geared to one common goal of loving Christ and knowing him more. And with that, many are attracted. I think people out there are really attracted to people who want to show concern to them. One of the things that uh, I have been learning lately is to just go beyond asking someone about how they are and leaving it at that. But just going deep into knowing who they are, where they come from, what they are pursuing, where they are working, what issues maybe they are facing in the society today, challenges that they are encountering, how their family backgrounds are like. And when you reach out to people with such concerns, then they'll feel at home with you. They feel that someone is really interested in their lives. And that's what fellowship does. When non-believers see a united body, a united community of believers, then that really attracts them to even join in and love God and say yes to the call of Christ. It is through the growth that comes from fellowship that witnessing becomes easy. 
the more you are exposed to speaking out in your small group, the more it becomes easy for you to go out and speak to someone else with the truth of the gospel. So I pray that each and every one of us is going to see that opportunity. That when you, you find yourself in a small, could, it, could be a house fellowship, could be a grace group, that you are given an opportunity to speak out and give your perspective about the particular thing you're speaking about. Take that as an aspect of growth, that from there you're able to easily speak to somebody and share the gospel of Christ. It is in the fellowship of believers that people support each other in prayer. As is recorded in Acts, where the believers came together and they prayed hard when either uh, some of the apostles were faced in trouble, such as persecution, when they did not know what to do in the ascension of Christ, they came together and prayed for one another. One case that is quite really a nice example to show is where one of the apostles has been imprisoned and then they pray hard and pray hard and see what miracle the Lord brings about that he comes out of prison and he continues with the work that the Lord has really uh, given unto him to continue with even in witnessing. Believers support each other in prayer when we are in a fellowship. It is in fellowship where people nurture each other's convictions. And I think in this, I would like to share a practical example in, in our grace group where one of the ladies shared with us about how she was convicted to share her story. She has quite a testimony and she felt that God was calling her to share out her testimony to someone and that probably would cause the people to really consider and get born again and see what... Christ can do because he can redeem anyone. And so as a grace group, we, are, we have small mentorship groups uh, within the grace group. And so as a mentorship group, we came together and decided that we are going to pray with her and we are going to even follow up on her. I think as we left grace group last week, we were like, we are going to hear the testimony of how it goes about this week, now this week. So we are waiting for to hear how it went about, how her sharing her testimony went, even in, you know, how the whole experience was. And we therefore should pledge to at least be part of a community of believers because it's there that you're going to be sharpened, it's there that you're going to grow. And in conclusion, I found... John Wesley's desire, a desire that each and every one of us should have. And he says, I want the whole Christ for my savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. He does not just want to compartmentalize his life, and I felt that this is the desire that I want in my very life. I want the whole Christ for my savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. It starts at Jesus. If there is an unbeliever, let them start there. Let them have Christ as their savior. Let them go ahead and know the truths of the word of God. Let them go ahead and be attached to a community of believers in fellowship. And let them now have the world as their mission field, which the Lord is calling us to. May the Lord strengthen us even as we continue to fellowship with one another. May the Lord help us to see the opportunities we have as a community. May the Lord bless you. Kindly let us give Evelyn a good hand clap. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for the message encouraging us to find fellowship. May the Lord strengthen your resolve also to continue to love him and to serve him. If for any reason something happened to you, when none of us is around. Who do you think will be worried about where you are? Supposing you collapsed somewhere,
who do you think will go around this campus asking, where did so-and-so go? Where did so-and-so go? If no one will ask where you are, it means you are not in fellowship with anybody. And it is possible that you may die alone somewhere, and it is the smell that will let people know that someone is dead. Are you in fellowship with anybody? Or you are taking these matters lightly. You need people in life the same way you will need them in death. Even your own grave you will not dig. Be in fellowship with someone. You need people just as much as people need you. More so for the sake of the kingdom. Let us believe and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for using Evelyn to sharpen our cutting edge, to challenge us to be in communion and in fellowship with others, so that we might develop a burden for others, so that our gifts and talents may be sharpened, so that we may be encouraged through the prayers of other people, and so that the world may know that we are truly your disciples and that our communion and fellowship will bear witness to the non-believing world. Help us to encourage one another, all the more as we see that day approaching. We thank you for the three the weddings that have been announced here, the wedding of Stephen and Ruth, the wedding of Dennis and Mary, the wedding of Emmanuel and Charlene, Dear Lord, we commit these young people to you. We know that families are begun by you, and therefore we commit their plans to you, and we beseech you, Heavenly Father, that you may open the floodgates of heaven and supply all that they need so that those marriages will begin well. But more so we pray that when indeed they marry, you will give them the wherewithal to live together to love you, to love one another, to honor you, and to serve you together. So we commit them to you for your blessing. And we pray that even in the remaining few days of their plans, you will shield them from the snare of the fowler, and that you will grant them the breakthrough that only you can give. Dismiss us with your blessing, and may none of us depart from your divine presence. Now together may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed day. Thank you for attending this chapel service. Thank you, our virtual audience. Continue to join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. God bless you. Have a blessed day.